the provider of believers and unbelievers and may his choicest blessings be on the seal of his prophets the last of his messengers and his holy progeny glorified is Allah who in the chapter of Anfal in verse 30 says Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa id yamkurul ladina kafaru liyab liyathbituka aw yaqtuluka aw yukhrijuk yamkurun wa yamkur Allah wallahu khairul makirin subhanallah wa ta'ala says and remember that time when those who remained unbelievers started to make plans against you and they made plans of three types. One, either to imprison you, or to kill you, or to deport you. And as they were making their plans, Allah was making His plans. And Allah is the best of the planners. That inshallah is what we discuss tonight. How those who did not believe made all kinds of plans. Indeed, Allah has identified those three plans. But Allah says, that was an exercise in futility. Because as they planned against the Messenger of Allah, Allah was making His own plans. And He is, ala kulli shay'in qadir, powerful over all matters. But before we get into those, I would like to raise just two matters with you. Firstly, Yesterday, in my discussion on genders, I mentioned <coughs> neutron vis-a-vis -vis protons, when in fact, of course, I should have mentioned electrons vis-a-vis -vis protons, neutrons being a neutral agency. And secondly, I have been asked to announce by the volunteers of the Madinatul Ilm Islamic Center Library that in service to you, they have taken yet another step, which I think is a very bold step. And the step they have taken is to bring the service now to your doorsteps. Until now, they expected that this service that they were rendering be rendered by them in the library precinct itself. The library is on the auditory. But they have felt that they perhaps can render even greater service by bringing the books to you. So, they will be distributing a form like this, this evening, and have requested me to announce that these forms will be available from this evening. All you are expected to do is to complete the portion right at the bottom, and having done so, 
to put them in the boxes that will be conspicuously available in this hall. And once they have obtained your name and addresses, they inshallah will make sure that those books that you have sought are supplied to you at your doorstep within your houses. Such, such is the additional efforts one is pleased to see in this community towards enhancement of, of hell. Yes, the subject of the Holy Prophet is indeed the subject of Madinatul Il. He called himself the very city of, of knowledge. And the first obligation then is for us to acquire that knowledge. And what better for you than that, that knowledge is now being brought to your doorstep. I am sure, particularly the youths amongst you, will take fullest advantage of this facility. The Holy Prophet... As I was saying yesterday, in advancing the cause of uh, the Holy Quran and his mission, his mission in that part being the first term of reference, Yatlu alayhim ayatihi, and in fulfillment of that first term of reference, he recited numerous ayat to the Makkans, some of which I indeed took the time to recite to you last night. Of course, we could not have ju done justice to all the ayats he would have so effectively recited to the Makkans of the time. Of the ayats that I should perhaps conspicuously have referred to but did not and time does not permit that we should, are the ayats which clearly start from the words. Wamin ayatihi. Those verses actually start with those words. Wamin ayatihi. And there are eight verses of that kind in the Holy Quran. But I will not trouble you to look up all those. I would suggest to the interested youths that they only look up Surah al Rum, chapter 30. From verse 20 onwards, six of those ayats appear seriatim. All starting with the words, Wamin ayatihi. But so much for that. To wind up that part of Yatlu alayhim ayatihi, the Holy Prophet set out these ayats in extenso. And in doing so, in doing so, managed to impress a number of the of people listening to him, predominantly those who were pilgrims who were coming to Makkah. The Makkans, of course, as we saw, had hijab, had a curtain between the Holy Prophet and themselves. But the Holy Prophet, despite the hostilities, was found undeterred in his mission. His confidence in Allah, his sense of duty to Allah, kept him on in his mission to continue with uh, denunciation of the idols and the, the proclamation of the unity of Allah. The Makkans, on the other hand, also felt that they needed to increase their hostilities and find other means of, uh, of inflicting harm on the Holy Prophet. They tried persecuting the converts. They found the Holy Prophet has found another exit for them to Abyssinia. Now they decided <coughs> they had to do something even more sinister. And the first step they took was to get in touch with Hazrat Abu Talib They knew that the strong support that the Holy Prophet had, under which he was able to carry forth his mission undeterred and, and, and unshrinking because of the molestations, they felt if that support was withdrawn of Hazrat Abu Talib salam, then they will make him shrink from his duty or at least dilute his vigor. They approached Hazrat Abu Talib salam and mentioned to him that the Holy Prophet, referred to him as the son of your brother, is causing so much chaos in the city. We of course do not tolerate that our gods are abused in this way. But we have not taken direct action against him because we respect you. Hazrat Abu Talib salam, had his status in that community. And they said we respect your rank, we respect your age, we respect your seniority in our community. And hence, we knowing that he has your support, do not take any action to molest your, 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 your nephew. But there is a limit to which we can go and there is a limit to which we can tolerate. So, we give you three options. 
either you tell him to stop all this and we bear no enmity to him or you join him once you join him we will know that you are also a participant on his side then we can have a fair game we can fight each other the two parties can stand against each other and see which party exterminates the other or thirdly if <coughs> If either of those is not acceptable to you, hand over Muhammad to us. Hazrat Abu Talib Islam did not want to take any decisions. He wanted to act in a manner acceptable to Allah. And he knew that that wish of Allah would best be made known to him by the Holy Prophet himself. But here I pause to interpose another matter that has arisen in the minds of some of my friends i am asked quite legitimately although i know a special session for uh, questions is uh, being uh, organized by those uh, uh, who have organized these sittings but before that let me deal with this i am asked that if hazrat abu talib alayhi salam so the prophet in prayer so his son in prayer with the Holy Prophet indeed asked Akhil to join them. Why didn't he? And the answer to that is well known in history. Hazrat Abu Talib salam knew too well that the Holy Prophet needed support. And that that support would best be forthcoming from him. And without such support, the mission would might have dwindled, might not have gone to the successes that it did. <coughs> and so he decided he would take a neutral line he would assist the holy prophet in such manner that none would dare assault him and yet he would not show to the opposition that he is a party on the other side because if he did jump the fence conspicuously ostensibly onto the side of the holy prophet then the Makkans would be able to say you are now an enemy of our gods and he could become a victim of attack as an enemy of their gods. So what he did was to tread a, a, a middle course. He did not tell the Meccans that he had become a Muslim in so many words. Although all the evidence, some of which we have already examined, some of which we will examine today, all the evidence showed that he was in heart, in spirit and in his actions. But be that as it may, he had not made a public declaration for that reason. And his activities, therefore, did not, did not allow him to present himself as a Muslim in public. And you will see that tonight, this stand and this course is made clear. If he had done so, the Makkans said, well, we can then fight you. We can fight uh, <coughs> the Holy Prophet and all of you on the basis that we are now two sets of oppositions. I say this incident more to let you know, although you perhaps already do, but to say it again on this eve of Friday, the answer the Holy Prophet gave to that. Answer inscribed in golden words by all the historians unanimously. He says, Oh my uncle, if the Makans were to put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, even then I will not shrink even one inch from my duty of working in the cause of Allah until Allah manifests His, his cause or until I perish in that cause. Would there not be a salawat on the Prophet for those words? words that he put forward to establish his his not only definite faith in his mission but his resolution and determination to remain on it steadfast even if support like that of Hazrat Abu Talib were to be withdrawn again and again he said only Allah can help me <coughs> and none can injure me so long as he helps me and we will see more of it tonight in his behavior Having heard that reply, 
Now listen to the reply of Hazrat Abu Talib to that. Those fantastic words were equally balanced by a fantastic reply from Hazrat Abu Talib alayhi salam. And you judge whether he is a Muslim or not. He turns to him and says, Remember this, that my conveyance of this message was a duty. But having heard your decision, let me say this to you, that I will never abandon you. Nay, never. The Holy Prophet smiled, gave a bow and departed. That was the stand of Hazrat Abu Talib to the last. And he made it plain to the Holy Prophet that that support will remain for him forever. What Hazrat Abu Talib then does is, he appeals to the Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib. He informs them of what has happened, of what he has been told by the Makkans. And that therefore he feels there is danger to the most honorable member of their clan, of the Banu Muttalib and the Banu Hashim, that is the Holy Prophet himself. And hence he appeals, them, appeals to them to summon their resources together in defense of the Holy Prophet. And so they all gather for that purpose. <coughs> the Makkans become even more frightened. Three things have happened now. They tried molesting the, the uh, converts. They are all in Abyssinia. And the people they sent to Abyssinia are back saying that they were rebuffed. They try molesting the Holy Prophet directly. And he answers with such ayats of Quran that they remain baffled. They try Hazrat Abu Talib, thirdly, there too, they have failed. And now they have this appeal from Hazrat Abu Talib to the members of the Abu Hashim and Abu Muttalib families. Hence, they decide they must, they must muster their forces. They called their own conference. And in that conference, various options were considered. History has recorded a number of proposals that were put in that conference as to what should be done to the Holy Prophet. But as our, as our ground has always been to rely on the words in the Holy Quran, I recited those words in the very opening of our session this evening. Allah says that they gathered to plot against you in three ways. So those are definitely three proposals that were considered. Firstly, firstly to imprison him. That was rejected in that conference because it was felt that at some stage he will come out. And when he comes out, he will revenge, take it, avenge the actions of the Makkans with even greater austerity. So that option was ruled out. The next option was deport him. It was then felt that if he were to be deported and he will go to another place, he could attack again with greater force, as indeed happened, as we shall see in nights to come, and particularly on the eighth eve, inshallah, if we proceed on course. <coughs> so that proposal was rejected. But the proposal that succeeded ultimately was that everything should be done to kill him. The question was how? And the answer to that was that he should be observed and at a vantage point, he should be killed. Question then was, by whom? Because if one person were to kill him, questions of blood money would arise. Questions of vengeance would arise. And hence they decided, and look at the decision of these people to just nullify the attempts of one honorable man to bring them to good senses and to justice. He said, they said, each member of each of their families, not even clans, each member of each of their family should come out with an open sword, drawn sword. And when they see the Holy Prophet, they should put their swords into him simultaneously so that none would be able to say who amongst them was the person who, called, who killed the Holy Prophet. You can imagine the, the, uh, the, the depth to which these assassins would go in making their plot. But they were plotting. Wayam Kurun, wa makar Allah, wallahu khairul makirin. As they made this plot, Allah had organized his, his answer. Allah had fully organized his answer. 
and and it was on that night on which they were to to kill the holy prophet that the whole scheme was blown off totally by the by the holy prophet himself on that night he decided on that night he decided that he will not sleep on his bed himself the question was who should sleep in that bed and he chose but one person because at that point in time in medina there were only three people left the question is why on that night then were there only three people left in in medina the three people left in medina were the holy prophet hazrat ali salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi and abu bakr question is how is it that on that night only three had remained and the answer to that is this <coughs> before they came to this final decision of um, assassinating the holy prophet they decided to raise a boycott against all the abdul muttalibs and all the uh, banu hashim they met they met in the kaaba itself that holy sacrosanct place was being used by the for the unholiest of purposes they gathered there and they set out a solemn document they set out a solemn document in which all of them covenanted that they will not do three things one they will not have any contract of marriage with any sons or daughters of banu hashim or bani muttalib so all those sons and daughters of those two families will not be able to marry a makkah secondly there would be a complete boycott against them nobody should sell anything to them nobody should buy anything from them and thirdly nobody should out of any good sense or out of any good feeling give them any food or drink at any time and if if anybody was found to do so he should be humiliated in public and that that boycott should continue until abu talib would decide to hand over the holy prophet to them well that was a serious situation hazrat abu talib alayhi salam immediately mustered his group and he decided that it was very unsafe to continue living in those conditions because if the uh, family <coughs> of the abu talib of of the abdul muttalib or any from the banu hashim are in problems they would not even be able to meet each other they would not even be able to seek help from each other they would not know who is in difficulty and how succor should be reached to him secondly he thought that this might be a prelude to further attacks and further physical persecution on the members of the hashim and muttalib families hence he announced that all the hashimites should gather in one place and hazrat abu talib himself provided the venue he had quarters in a cave in the mountain mount hujn then famously known as it is still today as as shebe abi talib today of course known only in history books as such shebe abi talib and he announced that all of those members of the two families should gather in shebe abi talib 40 40 Uh, elders of the of those two families and their families gathered in that cave and hazrat abu talib took upon himself <coughs> to provide sustenance that was no mean task how to supply food to all of them only in two months were they able to come out the month of rajab and the month of dhul hajj the shahrul haram the months of honor in which the makans could do them no harm the holy prophet of course in those two months came out to preach and he did excellent jobs in those two months alone he went out he went out and saw the pilgrims coming in the month of dhul hajjah and he spoke to them because they had no hijab between them and him he spoke to them and did a lot of good as a result word started spreading 
word started spreading that there is this prophet who is teaching people not to do harm, not to do evil, but to do good. Not to worship stones and wooden things, but to worship the real Allah, the real creator. Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab immediately made it their task to accompany the Prophet wherever they went. And whenever he would start speaking, they would heckle. But there was a limit to which they would go because the patience of the Holy Prophet was infinite. Indeed, that was the word. However, <coughs> those in that cave needed food. They needed water. And arrangements were made by Hazrat Abu Talib as and when it was possible. But history records. And I, I, I wish to say this in homage to that lady about whom I have been speaking for three nights consecutively, Bibi Khadija alayhi salam. It is said for her that when food came in that cave, she took it upon herself to distribute it. Food went to the little children of course first. And then from the elders to, to the elders, to the ladies, to the gents. And it is only if food was left that the Holy Prophet had a morsel or Bibi Khadija had a morsel. She shared that deprivation equally and alongside with the Holy Prophet. A gesture the Holy Prophet did not forget to his last day. To his last day when Aisha is reported, this is in Bukhari also, is reported to have, to have uh, asked the Holy Prophet once why he gave food to, to a certain neighbor who it was thought did not deserve. He said, I do so. Of course he did so, Qurbatan ilallah. But look at the answer he gave in this world. He said, I do so because it is the wasiya of, uh, of uh, Khadija that I should give food to the needy neighbors. So Aisha said, is that what he, she really said? And the Holy Prophet said, is it not enough that she would not eat with me? She and I would be the last to eat in Shebe Abu Talib until everybody was fed. It was a, it was a, a gesture of Bibi Khadija the Holy Prophet could never forget to, to his last. And it is that comfort which he obtained from her that also provided a great boost to his mission. Every day, every day she was there to console him. And of course, the support of Hazrat Abu Talib in that particular case. You will have heard before. But the impact of what I'm going to say will still be the same on you when I say that this lasted for three long years. It was not a question of three weeks. For three years, these two families sustained continuously this deprivation at the hands of the Makans, at the hands, shall I say, also of the Umayyads. Yet, a day came, as the Holy Prophet knew it would come, a day came when the Holy Prophet went to Hazrat Abu Talib salam and said, Oh my uncle, my Allah has informed me that that document on which the solemn declaration has been made has been eaten away by insects and all that is left in that document is the name of Allah except for that one word Allah the rest of it is already eaten up by insects one remembers the holy verses kullum man fiha fan wa yabqa wajhu rabbika how true were those words? And what does Hazrat Abu Talib do? Do you think he sits down to think about what he should do? He instantly walks out of the cave without a second thought, goes to the Kaaba, and there they were, the Meccans sitting in their conference. And, and they were discussing what should, they, what should be done because there were elements amongst them who were not Abu, Abu Muttalib or Abu, Abu or, or Banu Hashim. They were related to, for example, the family of Khadija alayhi salam. And they were saying, three years have passed, this is very long. We hear sometimes those children crying in hunger and thirst. 
was his, was history repeating itself in Karbala? These people were saying, we hear these children crying of hunger and thirst and we keep eating, we find it hard to live like this. But Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab and the die-hard Meccans would not budge. And soon they saw Abu Talib entering the Kaaba. And as they saw, Abu Jahl said, here he comes. He will give us the news that he is surrendering Muhammad. Because obviously they must now be tired out. But when Abu Talib comes, all he says is that Muhammad has told me, that that document on which you rely for the boycott is no longer valid because it's been eaten up. The document is not there any longer. All that there is on that document is the name of Allah. In other words, the mission of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. One would pause to say, Ja al haq wa zahaq al batil inna al batil kana zahuka. At every step of this mission, they were terrified. How does the Holy Prophet know this? He is in, um, in, uh, in the cave. So they ask him, so what do you want us to do about it? How do we go along? How do we go uh, forward on this proposition you make? Hazrat Abu Talib says, one of the two, check that document. If that document says... If that document complies exactly with what Muhammad says you will find on it, then give up your boycott and accept us as part of society generally, equally entitled to the rights of the society. If on the other hand, and look at his answer, if on the other hand you find your document intact, then I will agree that you are right and we are wrong. He yet did not say, I will hand over Muhammad. Isn't that a question to be pondered about? That sense of faithfulness and loyalty to the Holy Prophet into the roots of the of Hazrat Abu Talib alayhi salam. And why did he take that course? Why did he then have the courage to say, for the first time in his life perhaps, that we will know you were right and we were wrong, because he was so sure that what he was told must surely be the truth. If the Allah of Muhammad has told him so, that must be so. That is the tawakkul expected of Muslims of those days and of today. A lesson for us today. <coughs> the door of the Kaaba was opened. The document was taken out. And when it was shown to the public, it was all eaten by insects, except that the word Allah remained there. Abu Jahl still tried to outwit those who were there. But even the Makkans themselves began to see that there was more to it than what Abu Jahl and Abu, and, and Abu Sufyan were saying. They brought pressure on that conference and the conference decided that the boycott should be withdrawn. But... That withdrawal of the boycott by itself did not conclude everything. Because by then, the Abu Jahls, the Abu Sufyans, the Abu Lahabs were all extremely angry. They now felt they lost the game and they were not prepared to forget the past. <coughs> so, history records, I would like to say to you. That the truth is, not that they did not want to forget the past, but that they could not see the truth. They had become so blinded, that the truth that was now so conspicuously open to them, that their scheme had been foiled by Allah. Again, Wallahu khairul makirin. Again, foiled by subhanallah wa ta'ala. And there was nothing left of them except the word of Allah, meaning He is the true God. Yet they could not see light. Those words which I recited last night from the Holy Quran. There was a covering on their hearts. 
فی قلوبهم اکنہ و آذان و آذاننا وقر heaviness in their in their ears and wa bainaka wa bainana wa bainaka hijab and a curtain between the prophet and them they were blinded by their prejudices they were blinded by their egoism egoism they were blinded by their sheer obstinacy to stick to their past we need to pause at this stage and we need to reconsider ourselves does that not happen in our societies now and again doesn't it so happen that when we have two groups we are not prepared to think that the opposite side may be true fitna erupts in our societies entirely for that reason we become prejudiced we become egoistic what my family says must be right even if the other family what they say is not correct what i as a trustee say is correct what the other trustee says is not correct i as a member of this community must be respected for my views whatever the rest of the community feels some pamphlets emerge pamphlets are replied by pamphlets a lot of time is taken by the community is it all done in good cause the answer the holy prophet teaches is that in such circumstances perpetuity of that fitna is not the answer trying to find an answer to it is what leads the community forward then we do not take time on silly little things we march on to more important things like the library like the books etc things that will develop this community intellectually morally in- spiritually and move on keeping with the pace with the keeping pace with the times the answer to it is to have an open mind when there are two views on any point to have an open mind and to do that which is right to do that which is just as we will see the holy prophet dictated however even when that happened the makans said they will continue with their persecution whilst the banu muttalib and bani hashim went back to their houses and started ordinary lives everybody knew they were not going to have peace and the holy prophet had to take action in that matter personally as i said yesterday and as i will continue to say for the rest of the nights that i am speaking here the holy prophet was not only a prophet was not only a teacher to teach salah and saum he was a statesman in his own right except different from the modern statesman he was not a statesman to act according to the vagaries of politics he was a statesman who would conduct his affairs in the, on the basis of justice equity and what is right to do in the eyes of allah look at the situation till now you will not see any violence advocated by him and i'll come back to this subject because there are those who say that islam was spread by the sword let them read history impartially unprejudiced because those are qualities that we deprecate as we do in this sitting let them show us one example of violence advocated by the holy prophet violence was meted to him personally violence was meted to his beloved ali he took it violence was meted to his compatriot to 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 uh, his muazzin bilal in the manner we saw yesterday never did he advocate violence never and never did he practice it but he found means as a statesman of avoiding those violence from for his people before he could do anything this time two catastrophes occurred two catastrophes occurred one in the ninth year the the boycott was in the seventh year after ba'sa after the commissioning of his uh, prophethood and it continued till the 10th year and it is in that 10th year that hazrat abu talib passed away he was martyred in that year and you can imagine the state of the holy prophet when that happened one strong bulwark behind his back collapsed 
But he was those who would say in those occasions, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Yet, before he could recover from that, within three days, Bibi Khadija alayhi salam passed away. Within three days, the Holy Prophet found that unbearable and that colossal of a patient man named the year, the year of mourning. Amul Huzn. He said, this is the year of mourning. Indeed, he wore himself first the shroud of Bibi Khadija to give that shroud the protection of Islam. And he then wrapped Bibi Khadija in that shroud. He slept in the grave of Bibi Khadija himself and then lowered her into that grave. Such was the sanctity. Such was the respect that he gave to his beloved life, beloved wife with whom he had lived. 25 years of happy married life. We may see a lot of thorns that both of them got pricked with from the Makkans in those times, but between themselves, that Mawadda and Rahma, as Surat al Rum puts it, made it a glorious family, a glorious union of husband and life, which our brides and grief and grooms need to cherish. Yet, he had his compatriots to think of. He had his converts to think of. He had his family men and folkmen to think of. And hence he decided that he too will take immediate measures. And what he did was that in that very first year, <coughs> the 11th year after Ba'atha, he would stand in a place called Aqaba. Aqaba was a, po- a spot between Mina and Arafah. Between Mina and Arafah, he would stand when pilgrims would come, or semi-pilgrims, because they were as much tradesmen as they were pilgrims. They were pilgrims in name. We are being told today that we are tourists as much as hajjis. Well, they too were as much tradesmen as, as hujjaj. But be that as it may, when he saw them, he would address them. And in the eleventh year, six of them sat with him intently. They heard him conscientiously and said, you must be right. And we accept your mission. When they went back, when they went back, they spread the word amongst the Madanites. When they came back in the twelfth year, they met the Holy Prophet again. Five of them and seven other people. So a group of twelve now. What a number. Twelve. A group of twelve came again to Aqaba. They met in Aqaba and they turned to the Holy Prophet in that year and said, We accept your mission. You tell us to make a pledge and we will make a pledge to you and to Allah as you dictate. And the Holy Prophet said, the pledge, the first pledge I want you to make is to accept that there is no God but Allah. La sharika lahu, no associate with him and the idols have no powers of deity. They said accepted. Secondly, you will not steal anything from anybody nor harm anybody. Thirdly, you will not commit adultery or fornication. Fourthly, you will not commit infanticide. You know, that is the time when children used to be killed by parents themselves. When kanu min qablu lafi dhalalim mubin, as we discussed the very first night of our sittings. And they said, yes, all that is out. Second, fifthly, you will not, you will not uh, uh, speak evil of any woman. Under any circumstances, no do any evil to her. And they said, yes, all those are accepted. Sixthly, you will assist the Prophet in what is right. What a glorious condition. Was that Prophet capable of doing anything wrong? Yet that sense of fairness in him. To say to them that you will assist the the Prophet in what is right. And seventhly, you will defend the Prophet when he needs your defense. They said, all these are accepted. That then became the first pledge of Aqaba. He sent them out with one of his disciples. Remember the first term of reference, Yatlu alayhim ayatihi, which he had done. Secondly, وَيُزَكِّهِمْ They were purified by then in their hearts. The idols had moved out of their hearts. Allah had taken the place of those idols in their hearts. They were purified. The third step then, وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ That started. So, a disciple was given to them who will teach them the laws of Islam and keep them on the path of Islam. The disciple went the next year after that, the 13th year after Ba'atha, when they returned to Aqaba, 
They return 75 of them. And they say to the Holy Prophet, we are now ready to go further with our pledge. And the Holy Prophet said, very well, let us have a conference. So they had a conference at which Hazrat, at which the Holy Prophet invited Abbas, his uncle Abbas, because Hazrat Abu Talib was no longer there. Hazrat Abbas was still not a Muslim at that stage. He attended, look at the trust the Holy Prophet reposed in him. And he saw the conference and was mightily moved by it. There were these people confirming their pledge. All the seven conditions I set out for the first pledge were repeated and reconfirmed. And they then said, we now have come with an invitation to you, O Holy Prophet, that you come over to Madinah. Wallahu khairul makirin. The Prophet does not solicit. He does not kill anybody. He does not touch anybody. Here is a group of 75 people begging him to go over to Madinah. And the Holy Prophet says, yes, when the time will be ripe, I will come, but I cannot come. Rahmatun alameen, this is we are talking about. I cannot come leaving my people behind. I will see them saved and then I will be with you. The Holy Prophet said, the balance of fairness with this man is only on one side. It is only he being fair to the others, so it appears. He turns to them and said, I laid my conditions, you accepted them all. You lay your conditions to me, my brothers. I would like to fulfill your conditions. Look at the extent of the charity of this person. And they say two things then, Holy Prophet. First, we agree to support you. We can see danger ahead and we are ready for it. All we need to know is that if we are killed in fighting with you, what is there for us? And the answer of the Holy Prophet, that what is there for you, my promise is that there is heaven for you, there is bliss and peace forever after your death for you. Salam, qawlam min rabbir rahim. They said, we satisfied, that is the answer we wanted. I pause. Show me a statesman who can say that. Yazid can only offer this governorship of Rai. He can o offer Umar ibn Sa'ad the 100,000 dirhams. He never gave Umar ibn Sa'ad that. He never gave the governorship of Rai to Umar ibn Sa'ad. They can make promises which they will breach. But to be able to make a promise of the hereafter with such confidence that will be accepted with that, with, with that earnestness established the truth of the inner feelings and the inner realities of the Holy Prophet. He didn't promise this earth, he promised the heavens. He said, that is your promise. And look at the second thing they ask. So moving it is, he says, they say, O Holy Prophet, we see the position in which you are today. It is natural that you are in a position to accept our invitation and come to us. We fear and we see that tomorrow you people will turn to your religion because it is a religion of truth. They will come to your religion. When they come to your religion, won't you go back to them? Look at the love they had developed for the Holy Prophet. Look at the affection, the depth of affection. They now do not want to give up that Holy Prophet. They not only want him with them, they want him ever to be with them. That love and affection, I say, would only have developed in the hearts of these questioners if that love and affection was imbued and imbibed into them with the sincerity of the Holy Prophet. And listen to his answer. He says, no, I give you my word that when I come to you, I shall remain with you. There will be a bond between us of interest and trust. I've translated Arabic into English as much as was possible to do of interest and trust, both of those. And I shall remain with you to my last. I say, O oh Holy Prophet, you not only remain with them to the last, the green dome reigns over Medina till today, and we who go to Makkah come over to Medina to salute that green dome till this today, and honor to the Madanites for what they did. That was the second pledge of Aqaba. The Holy Prophet immediately decided that he will not go 
out of Medina on his own. He organized for all those Abu Banu Hashim and Abdul Muttalib to leave. Soon they were given orders to leave. They each knew whom to contact. These people who left Makkah are now the Muhajirs. And they were received by those converts in Medina called Ansars. So they knew where to go. They had their, their hospitality guaranteed. In, 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 in vast number of people left, but all left clandestinely. In groups of two or three they left, so that they are not noticed and, and persecuted by the Meccans. They leave quietly, taking a route by which they would not be noticed. But history says that in two months time, 150 families had left Mecca. Utba is reported to have said, entire quarters in Mecca felt deserted. And they got worried. So they decided, and they had the conference at which they decided, they should murder the Holy Prophet. And indeed, they set out on that plan. And on that night of Hijrah, they got together at the house of the Holy Prophet. Indeed, they saw somebody lying on the bed of the Prophet. As I said, by then, therefore, only three were left. All had gone. The Holy Prophet, Imam Ali alayhi salam and Abu Bakr, and who was asked to sleep on that, on that bed, the answer is known in your hearts, leave alone your tongues and minds. Imam Ali alayhi salam was asked to sleep. He leapt onto the bed and pulled over the green mantle of the Holy Prophet over him and went to sleep. And, and, and the one to sing a song for him is the Holy Quran himself. And there is one man amongst you people who will sell his nafs, who will sell his soul for the pleasure of Allah. The Meccans looked through the crevice. They saw somebody sleeping on the bed. They saw the green mantle of the Prophet. Indeed, he slept as the Prophet slept. The night passed. They became anxious. Why doesn't this man come out? Time for him to go to Kaaba and pray. He doesn't seem to be coming out. They decided they will barge in. And when they barged in, this person who is fast asleep is suddenly woken up and disturbed. He wakes up disturbed and says, what do you want? Look at the question Ali puts. What do you want? And they say, we are looking for Muhammad. Where is he? He says, I know not. He pulls the mantle. I know not, he says, and walks out of the house. He had no moment for those politics. The Holy Prophet had left that night from that very house. When all of them were there, they were there out with their swords drawn, ready to kill him. He left unnoticed, unknown. Quran, Quran again. Loudly proclaiming, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ صَدًّا وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ صَدًّا فَأَخْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ There was a barrier in front of them, a barrier behind them, a cover on top of them, and they could see nothing. Safe and sound, the Holy Prophet left Makkah, left Makkah towards Medina, and spent his time that evening in the Mount Thawr, lest he should be detected. Well, we enter Medina, inshallah, tomorrow evening. But we see a parallel in Karbala here. Those who were able to see the truth and moved, moved not only from falsehood to truth, came to the Holy Prophet and said to the Holy Prophet, Oh no, we will help you, you come to us. We pledge that we will stand by you and we will fight for you. In Karbala, however, there was a more curious example of her. Hur was the person who brought the, whole, the, the, the grandson of the, of the Prophet to Karbala. He brought him there. But on that night of Ashura, he heard what people heard in Shebe Abi Talib. He heard children crying for food. He heard children crying for water. He heard from children, Al-Atash, Al-Atash, al Oh thirst, oh thirst, oh thirst. And Hur started asking himself, but am I not responsible for this? Have I not brought these children to this place? A place in which they do not even have water to drink. Did the grandson of the Prophet deserve this at the end by end? He goes to Umar ibn Sa'ad and says, Oh Umar, 
Can't you see? Can't you hear these children crying in this well, in this way? Has your heart become a heart of stone? So Amr says, "What do you want me to do?" Hur says, "Are all doors for settlement closed?" And Ibn Saad says, "Yes, all doors for settlement are closed." And from that moment, Hur turns his face away from Amr. The moment Amr says that, he turns his face away, walks to it, and. Finds his path towards the towards Imam Hussein alayhi salam, goes to his camp only to collect his son and says, "Oh Ali, I have found the truth. I have found where heaven is. I am going to the grandson of the Prophet. I do not want to go to heaven alone. If you want to come along, you come along." They both gallop along, and there was in the early dawn Imam Hussein alayhi salam outside his camp. He sees Hur coming. Hazrat Abbas, as I said, always next to the Imam. He says to Hazrat Abbas, "Oh Abbas, my guest Hur is coming. Please go and receive him." Hazrat Abbas says, "Yes, but Maula, he is Hur, meaning he is the commander of the enemies." And then Imam Hussein says, "Oh Abbas, today Hur is not coming as an enemy." Today, Hur is not coming to hold my reign. He is coming in as a friend. He is coming in to sacrifice his body. Hazrat Abbas immediately gallops along. Hur has already come nearer. By the time Hazrat Abbas alayhi salam reaches him, Hur comes down from his horse, tells his son, "Bind my two hands in my handkerchief. I cannot approach the grandson of the Prophet." I can only seek forgiveness from him. I will seek my forgiveness with my hands chained in my in in in, in my in my handkerchief. He then goes on his knees. Hazrat Abbas says, "Oh, what are you doing? My master will be unhappy with me if I take his guest like this." Hur says, "What can I do? How can I please this master except by being on my knees to him?" And when the Imam sees Hazrat Abbas is not able to prevail on Hur, this grandson of the Holy Prophet, we discussing, marched on himself, comes to Hur, lifts Hur up, and says, "Hur, what are you doing?" Hur says. I have asked to come for forgiveness for a sin that is unforgivable. Oh, grandson of the Prophet, I brought you here. Look what has happened. Your children are crying of thirst and hunger. Your children are crying that there is no water. And look at the reply Imam Hussein gives to that. Our lives be sacrificed for that Hussein. He says, Oh, Hur, you are talking of my children. I am ashamed that you are my guest, and I do not have the water to extend to you. <laughs> that I do not have water to extend to you, a glass of water to you, to my guest. Who says this is not what I came for, O grandson of the Prophet? Forgive me. Nobody could have forgiven me but for the grandson of the Prophet. The grandson of Rahmatun lil alamin alone can forgive the sin. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam says, "O oh, Hur, I have forgiven you. My Allah has forgiven you. Anta Hurun fi dunya wal akhira." Hur says, "O oh, my master, I will only know that if I am the first to be given permission to go and fight for you." Imam Hussein says, "Hur, if that is your wish, do so." Then he turns round to his son and says, "Oh Ali, I do not want that I should be the first to go to heaven. You go first. You fight these enemies first." His son Ali goes to fight <laughs> to fight the enemies, and when Ali is assassinated and he calls for his for his father, Ya Abata Adrikni, Hur gallops along to the body of his son. Imam Hussein says, "Hur, wait. I'll come with you." Imam Hussein goes along with him. Hur says. You do not need to take this trouble, my master. He says, "Hur, I know what it is for an elderly father to go to the body of such a young, youthful son." We turn round tonight, Shabbat and Juma, to Imam Hussein alayhi salam and say, "Oh, Maula, when Shahzada Ali Akbar fell to the ground, when Shahzada Ali Akbar fell to the ground, perhaps even Abbas was not there. How did you alone handle that situation?" <laughs> ألا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون إن لله وإن إليه راجعون فاتحة